when you have a look at this, this is just a quadratic equation, isn't it? So in fact, we've been solving this for a number of years. In many regards, there's not too much here that you don't already know um, in terms of how to solve this. How would you normally look at an equation like this and try and solve? Any suggestions? Yeah, go ahead, Jan. Uh, in this case, it's like 5, 2, and 1 of weird numbers. You just yeah, sure. If you're looking at these and you're like, I do not know the number that when I, um, a pair of numbers rather, that adds to negative 2 and multiplies to 5, I'm struggling a little bit to work out a nice easy factorization. That shouldn't surprise you because uh, we're looking at these guys, right? You know when you're guessing at numbers by inspection, you're thinking, oh, it might be 2 and 3 or negative 4 and 8, all that kind of thing. We can think of integers pretty easily. But there are so many more combinations of complex numbers because you've got the real axis and you've got the imaginary axis as well. Um, in most cases, you're going to say, forget it. I'm just going to go to the formula. Okay? So I'm going to start you off, and then I'm going to let you loose. The quadratic formula, we know this pretty well, right? What are we going to start with? Minus b, which in this case is? Negative 2, right? Plus or minus square root of, okay, what's coming underneath here? Four. Yeah, so it's going to be um, 4 because I get that from negative 2 all squared. And then I'm going to go minus 4 AC, yeah, 5 times 1. So you can see I'm going to get 20 from that shortly, okay? I'm going to divide that all by, yeah, 2 times 5, which in this case will give me 10. Now, even before you started to do much working out, you can already see why this fits under this category. And our discriminant is negative. In real number land, we would get to this point and say, oh, I don't need to worry about this anymore. No real solutions. But we're in the complex plane. So I want you to go and proceed. Think about all the things you know about how we define imaginary numbers. Get an answer out. I might give you a um, minute, minute and a half to have a go at that. Off you go. How did you go? Did you, did you arrive like I did? Um, maybe you arrived so long ago, you're like, I've already started having a look at the next example. That's okay. Before we do that, let's just make sure we know what's going on here. Okay? We have a real equation, sorry, an equation with real coefficients, but we've landed it on a complex solution because we have a negative discriminant. And that's fine. We know how to deal with negative, uh, sorry, the square root of negative 16 now. We, don't, we hardly bat an eyelid. Okay? So we've got both of our square roots in there, plus minus uh, 4i, and then just a little bit of simplifying. Okay? So is that all right? Happy with that? So you're going to um, encounter plenty of these, and questions like this are going to arrive when we try and solve not just square roots, but the nth roots of complex numbers, which, as you see, we'll get onto later on. But it becomes a bit more meaty when you start looking at monsters like this, right? Even just looking at the equation, you're like, uh, okay. Now, what I'm going to suggest we do is, um, you can go about this question more or less exactly the same way that you did this one, okay? However, I'm going to encourage you to uh, try a different path um, for a couple of reasons. The quadratic formula, right? Essentially what it is, is an automation of an older technique that you learnt earlier, an algebraic technique, which is kind of neat and fancy, but then like, as soon as you've got a formula for it, you're like, why do I need this technique, this algorithm, I'm just going to use a formula. Does anyone remember what's the formula, sorry, what's the, the process, the thinking, underneath the quadratic formula that gave it to us? Yeah. Isn't it completing the square? It is completing the square. Like, this plus or minus the square root of, etc. it came from us rearranging ax squared plus bx plus c. Once you rearrange it, you have to divide by some stuff, and then you end up with this if you make x the subject. Now, what I'm going to encourage you to do, and you'll see why as we progress through the question, when you have complex coefficients, completing this square turns out to be probably a nicer, neater way to set it out than the quadratic formula. You'll arrive at the same solution. Okay? But let's have a go at this. Okay? I'm going to begin by saying, in order to uh, write this in a way that's useful com for completing the square, I actually want this term and this term, my two terms with z in them, I want them sort of by themselves. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write z squared. I'm also going to factorize 2 out of that. And you'll see why in a second if you're remembering how completing the square works. Um, and then there's my z. I'm going to leave them on the left-hand side. And then I'm going to take this constant. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get the constant terms all on the right-hand side. So in this case, what should I add to both sides? 5 minus 2i, thank you. So that's over there. So nothing has changed to this at the moment. But you can see what I've done is I've kind of thought to myself, I'm going to complete the square in a second. So I've left this spot here for the completing the square bit, right? Um, to complete the square, we have to add a certain thing. And maybe you're seeing now why I have took out a factor of 2. What's the thing I have to add? 
1 plus 3i whole squared. 1 plus 3i or squared, perfect. So where this comes from, if you recall, is you take this coefficient here, you halve it, then you square it. Halve and then square. Um, this two I factorize out so that this is just the half, and then here's the square. Of course you can't just add it to the left hand side, you've got to add it to the right hand side as well. So far so good, is that okay? So I've actually completed the square now, but the whole point in doing that is so that I could factorize the left hand side. And this is now currently in the form, I might write it underneath actually in this colour, this is in the form a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. Do you see that? So I can write it as a minus b or squared, which is exactly what I'm going to do now. So my a is just z. What's my b? Have a look at how I factorise it. It's just going to be 1 plus 3i. Do you agree with that? 1 plus 3i. And that is all squared. There's my factorization. And then over here on the right, I might as well start to simplify this thing. So I'm going to go 5 minus 2i. When we have a go at this guy, um, you're going to get a squared um, plus 2ab plus b squared. What's 3i all squared? Yeah, it's 9i squared, which is minus 9. So I'll write that minus 9 along the end there. Okay. When you have a look at this, um, left hand side looks good, it's factorised, but in order to uh, tidy this up, I'm going to get something on the right hand side here by collecting some like terms. So I think that I can see real, real, real. So when you put them all together, what's going to be your real term? Three. Now you have three. Imaginary term? Plus four. Plus four i. Okay, now on the left hand side, we still have this thing that's being squared. So clearly to make z the subject, I'm going to need to take the square roots of both sides. Now at this point here, you can see why we had to wait until we developed our understanding of square roots um, of complex numbers to be able to tackle things like this, right? Because you will end up with something complex here and then you've got to take the square root of it. Now you would go and do this as a separate process, but luckily for you, it's almost like it was designed on purpose. You already know what the square roots of this particular number are. <laughs> They're plus or minus. 1 plus 2i. Do you agree? Plus or minus the, all of 1 plus 2i. So if I take the square roots of both sides, you're going to get this guy. And the left hand side is no longer squared. You okay with that? Are you tracking? Now at this point here, um, I don't need this working in the right hand side anymore. So I'm going to get rid of it. At this point here, you're very close to getting z, aren't you? Um, you just need to add 1 plus 3i to both sides. Uh, and then there's going to be more collecting of like terms with this guy here, right? So let's go ahead and do that line. I'll add 1 plus 3i to both sides. Uh, here's my plus and minus of this. So at this point, um, we've got a negative case, this minus this, and a positive case, this plus this, right? Can you go ahead and tell me what the uh, negative case will be? What happens to the real parts when you're subtracting? 1 minus... One, it cancels, that's nice. Uh, and then you've got 3i minus 2i. So you just get one of your solutions being i. That's convenient. Um, and then you've got another solution that comes from adding them. So 1 plus 1 gives you 2. What will the uh, imaginary component be? Plus 5i. And those are our two complex solutions from our equation with complex coefficients. Does that make sense? So you do need to take a bit of care, obviously, in your working for subsequent questions. This line here will require a bit of extra work because you've got to be like, oh, what are, what are the square roots of this thing? I need to work that out separately. But then you'll progress through as you just saw. Okay? Question two, right? And I admit, this is partly my fault for the way I've leaned you, right? I told you this was about solving equations. And then you have this set of skills that's very useful and that you can just use over and over again. Except for this teeny, teeny problem, that you could pre get presented with objects like these, which are not equations. Uh, there's no, they're not equal to anything. No equal sign, not an equation. These are expressions, right? So how do we factorize these? Well, rather than saying this equals zero, which we don't actually know, um, you could say, I want to consider if it were equal to zero and then go ahead and use a formula. But there's a much easier way, and I can do it for both of them just using the algebraic tools you already know. For instance, I know this doesn't look like a nice, neat thing to factorize at the moment, but let me change it into something that is nice and easy to factorize. You're looking at that thinking, 
This is, this is still not better for me. I'm not, I'm not seeing it, right? I'm not feeling the love. That's okay. Tell me the moment at which it clicks for you. What, what am I doing here? I've got squares. I've got squares. That doesn't look like a square, but it is. It is to us. This is i squared 6 squared, isn't it? Right? So therefore, you're like, oh, this is 6i all squared. So therefore, I can just write this. Sorry, that's a squared. I can just write this with an a minus b, a plus b factorization, and it's done. Okay? Now, when you have a look at this, uh, it's not exactly the same. There's not going to be such a nice, neat difference of squares in here. But remember how we were looking before? You don't just have the quadratic formula at your disposal. You don't just have difference of squares. You can say, I can find the part of this that I can turn into a square, right? This thing I can complete by adding what? Think, look at this, I halve and then I square, right? So that would be, in this case, 1. But you don't actually have 1 in this equation. That's all right. You have more than 1. So you just separate the 1 out from the rest of it. Right? Does that make sense? So you're like, now what I've got here is a square. And this doesn't look like difference of squares, but I've already illustrated that it's not hard to change it into that form. Does that make sense? So I guess what I'm trying to say is, number one, be cautious of turning expressions into equations. And number two, now that you have complex numbers up your belt, up your sleeve, you can actually not just handle difference of squares, you can handle sums of squares. Okay?